Good morning and welcome to our live talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our live talk program covering motivation on your Monday morning rise and shine. And this Monday morning here, we're looking at a topic, what Israel was supposed to be, you are supposed to be. So we're looking at what Israel was supposed to be, you are supposed to be. So this is our talk for this morning here as we do our motivation here. So welcome back um, to our live talk program I'd, as I'd taken a little break here doing some things with church like camping and stuff. And now we're back and we're going to be um, focusing here on building up the vibes here. So welcome again to our live talk program and um, some things we'll be doing soon on Revive Reform Radio. Um, so let us pray. Our Father, Lord in heaven, we thank thee again for your blessings, for your word, and for the guidance that you give us and the opportunities that you lay before us. I pray, O Lord, that we may take hold of the iron of salvation and we may be blessed by your word and by the sacrifice of Jesus. Be with us, we pray, as we study together this morning, for Christ's sake. Amen. So we're looking here at this um, idea here, or this concept that is in the Bible, this teaching, that what Israel was supposed to be, you are supposed to be. And um, as you look at this, you'll see that um, what Lord has set out for Israel, the promise that was given to Israel, as is stated in Hebrews, that there's still a, a, a rest remain for God's people. The blessings are still there. Um, if the blessings were not still there and still waiting to be fulfilled, um, then Christ would already have come. But come um, or come, it would be past. So we wouldn't be talking here. <laughs> but uh, these blessings are still there for us to attain to. And there is still a rest remaining. And when we think about this rest, we think about um, this idea here that people have no rest. There's constant turmoil in the lives of individuals, whether they be in the church or not. And that tells you that the rest is not here. Because if the rest was here, then we would already have seen Christ come. So the promise still remain. The um, hope that God's people will get it together is still there. And we are told that it will happen as we come close to the end of time. And so we'll begin by reading this passage of scripture as an encouragement. So what we're looking at again is what Israel was supposed to be. You are supposed to be modernly. And that, that's the reality. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 through 9 is our first passage of scripture, 1 through 10 as our encouragement here. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 through 10. And it says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations on the earth. So I'll pause there a little bit. So here, what separates Israel specifically is that ultimately when the Lord has given them this statement, they already had crossed the Red Sea. They already had had the deliverance from Egypt. So the Lord is not talking to people on the street. He's not talking to Egyptians or Canaanites. He's talking to people that were delivered. They were already delivered. They already went through the Romans chapter 7 experience. They already had seen the miracles, received the blessing. They baptized in the water by Moses going through the Red Sea. They already had seen the pillar of clouds. Uh, this is the people that he's speaking to. And he says, if you will just hearken diligently to what I say and to keep all that I command thee. Now, remember, there's a lot that is commanded of Israel. And if you listen to regular Bible expositors and expounders and theologians, they will say, that that's a lot. There's just too much. Uh, but remember that the promise of the Holy Spirit is that the Lord will write the commandments in your heart. So there's no question about the possibility. And remember, the possibilities that God put inside of you and me, they're infinite. Uh, it, that's just the reality. Our capabilities of learning and carrying out so many different points of information and instruction is marvelous. As a matter of fact, modernly, we have proven that what the capabilities of the brain, supercomputers are still trying to figure out. So that tells you that when God says, 
all that I, all that I command you, you should do. Somebody might say, that's a lot. How can somebody keep all that? How could somebody keep all that? How could somebody follow all those rules and regulations and all that stuff? Well, you know, God knows what he's talking to. <laughs> so if God tells you you can do it, you can do it. Uh, again, God is not talking to people who didn't cross the Red Sea. See, people get into these kind of discussions and they start talking as if God is talking to Egyptians. God is not talking to Egyptians. Uh, and so somebody listen to me and they say, ah, I, I, let, let's keep going. All right, you don't have to hear what I'm saying because God is not talking to you then, obviously. God is talking to people who already crossed the Red Sea. God is talking to people who already accepted him as a savior. He delivered them. He's talking to people who saw the miracles, saw the clouds. And he's saying to them, you can do this. You can be righteous. You can be a holy nation. And you have the same blessing in front of you. You can hearken to the voice of the Lord. You can do his will. Because it's possible. It, it is there. The capabilities is there inside of you. And the experience is already there because you already are delivered. You already have a savior. You're all right. <laughs> You're good. You just need to just believe and walk in faith and grow in faith. So he says here, you're supposed to, now remember he's saying this to them and they would fail at what many people fail today. They would say, this is just too much or the saying is too hard. How do you expect me to do all that? But remember, as I say, the more we study about the human body, especially the brain, it is phenomenal. Even what is coded into the brain right there at birth. Before we come out, the amount of stuff that is coded in and is put in there by God that a child comes out and a child knows to do things that is remarkable. But we tend to limit ourselves. And when we limit ourselves, we're limiting God. Well, we are not to do that. Verse 2 of Deuteronomy 28 says, And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou hearken unto the voice of the Lord. Now notice everything that we do, we start to learn real quickly from an early age, that if you study a little bit and learn a little bit, you start to understand things that you were not taught. And it's the same thing with blessings. When you do something, you get blessings that you can see because everything that God does and everything that God commands is layered. There's multiple layer to it. And you start to learn that real quickly. You know, you start to learn, oh, I changed my diet. Oh, I'm saving money. Oh, I'm getting healthy. Oh, my brain is thinking faster. And all that was because you decided not to eat certain things and start to eat something different. You have all these secondary chain reaction that you didn't know was going to happen. So God says, you do this, the blessings will overtake you. Today, you need to think like that. You need to know whatever you do that the Lord tells you to do you're going to be blessed and the blessing is going to be more than what you thought you were going to get. So go right in the head and do what you're commanded or whatever the con your conscience is commanding you or whatever the word of God is telling you. Because what Israel was supposed to be, you are supposed to be that. And if you do it and I do it, then ultimately the church, us as a people, are blessed. But when you don't do it, it doesn't matter what happened, you limit the blessings. So look at this verse 3 now. Continue reading. Blessed shall thou be in the city, and blessed shall thou be in the field. So then the, the inverse is implied that if you don't hearken, you will not be blessed wherever you go. So we want to be blessed. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flock of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy baskets and thy store. Blessed shall be when thou comest in, and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemy that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy, thy face, and they shall come out against thee one way, and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessings upon thee in thy storehouse and in all that thou settest thy hand unto. 
and he shall bless thee in the land which thou, the Lord God thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee in holy people unto himself, as he had sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandment of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. Now pause here again before I go to verse 10. Notice there that the Lord shall establish thee a holy people. You notice this is on the Lord. See, the Lord comes to you and he calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And the Lord says, I'm going to establish you a holy person. Now, you could listen to preachers and other people tell you crazy things. Hey, you can't live holy. You can't live righteous. You can't keep the commandments of God. And you listen to the, the voice of the devil. No matter how, what church he belongs to and what, however he looks and however he sounds. The Lord, this is the Lord's promise, and you have to claim the Lord's promise and walk in the promise. You have to believe it. If you don't believe it, because remember, you have to believe that God is, and it is a reward of them that diligently seek him. So you have to believe that the Lord can make you a holy person. And not think about whatever failings, weaknesses you have. Don't worry about that. It's the Lord's promise. The Lord knows who he's talking to, and he knows the capabilities and the possibilities. You know, just as a person can be as worthless as you can imagine, they can be worthless, just done right, no good. It is the same thing as God says, you can be holy. The opposite is true. You just have to believe it. And not think about, well, whatever weakness you have. Because remember, whatever weakness you had in the past, you have overcome something. You have broken some bad habit. And God can have you break all the shackles and his chains that the devil has given you either because of your practice or because of your parents, you know, training. However you got it, you can break them. So the Lord says, I'll establish you a holy person. Th this is the reality. And when you understand this, you understand when you read the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, what you're reading is the fact that some people attained to this reality, but the majority never. So this is why I say, what Israel was supposed to be, you are supposed to be. This reality can be yours because it was the reality for some people. It's just the, the reality that the majority of Israel, as it says in Isaiah, that we're going to read later, Isaiah chapter 1, that the majority of Israel never attained to this blessing. But the testimony of the Bible is that God always had people who attained to this blessing. And this is why the Bible says there was always a remnant. So again, if you look at this, verse 10, and all people of the earth shall see, notice there, shall see. It's not a matter of that you claim. You see, it's wanting to protect, pro, you know, to profess and to state good things about yourself. Evil doers always state good things about themselves because that's what boasting and pride is. The person is embellishing what they are. But the Bible doesn't say it that way. The Bible says, it will be seen. That means it's evident that this reality is yours. It's not you're claiming it. If you look at the state of the church today and what the pastors and are preaching, that preach in these mega churches and prosperity gospel churches, they preach that you name it and claim it, but it's not your reality. You know, most of the time they're preaching to a whole bunch of people who are messed up in their lives, messed up in their heads, messed up in their social behavior. But here the Bible says, people shall see, not you saying it. You know, these churches are packed with people just saying. People saying that they're filled with the Spirit. You ever meet these people? They come on and they come up to you and say, are you, have you received, received the Spirit? Next time somebody asks you that, say, have you received the Spirit? Or are you living righteous? Or you stop all the sinning that you're supposed to stop doing? Because, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is a testimony if you have the Spirit. And many times you deal with some of the most obnoxious, rude you know, just downright dirty and low people telling you about if you receive the Spirit. You receive the Spirit. You receive the Spirit. So when you look at this, the Bible says, people shall see, not what you say about yourself. You don't have to go and tell people that you you have the Spirit. They'll see that there's a sweet Spirit in you. How can somebody have the Spirit and they're, they're so sour? Depressed people, people who just fill off all kind of devil is talking about they have the spirit so when you look at it in here is a difference 
it is and all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord and shall be afraid of thee. There's a different experience. It's not an experience where you're going around running your mouth about who have the spirit and who don't have the spirit and jumping around making noise. A bunch of empty vessels. Um, that's not going to be your reality. Your reality is that the evidence will be there because the blessings in your life will be there. I know so many people, they've been told this false doctrine and they, 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 their life is just filled with misery, but yet they claim that because they jump around and make noise that they have the spirit. Silliness. So in, our, um, in Acts of the Apostles, this book here that we play on Revive Reform Radio at the 4 o'clock hour, one of the books, um, written by Ellen G. White, I'm going to read this, this. There's two paragraphs that I'm going to read in Acts of the Apostle, page 11. And I'm going to read two paragraphs. But right now I'm going to read only one sentence. Later on at the end of the program, I'll read um, the two paragraphs. But I'll read one sentence because this is the fulcrum or my anchor for this morning. Here my anchor. Uh, the church is God's fortress, his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. So I'm going to read it again for you. The church is God's fortress, his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. Now remember, my topic is what Israel was supposed to be, you are supposed to be. All right? So, think about this. There's a world around us. <laughs> the world around us is revolted. The citizens, that means the individuals. You know, she's mentioned world and church. So the church and the world are comprised of individuals. So the individuals around us are in revolt. And we are supposed to be held in, held as a fortress and as a refuge separately from the world. That means we are supposed to be held not in revolt. We are in obedience. So you are supposed to be what Israel was supposed to be. You are supposed to be that city of refuge. You are supposed to be that safe fortress where when the evildoers are attacking all around and killing everything, wiping out villages, you are supposed to be safe, not being wiped out. And you are supposed to be held by God's blessing, by God's mercy, by God's grace. In that state, while everything is falling all around, falling apart around, while the devil is wreaking havoc in the lives of everyone around, you and your family are supposed to be held as a safety, as a fortress. You are not supposed to be in revolt and receiving the weapons that the devil is giving everybody around. You are supposed to be held in obedience, in blessing. And that's what it is. See, this is what is so missing in the church and in the world. And this is what God called you for. God calls you that you're not supposed to be held in revolt. You're not revolting against God. You're not in rebellion against God. It doesn't matter. You, you're not supposed to be at least. And But the world is supposed to be. And as they're in revolt, as you know, in war, war is the devil's playground. Because in war, it brings out the most violent, vicious, carnal, wickedness that you can see human beings can display. Anything goes in war because people are mad and they're mad as hell because they're going to hell. And so you're not supposed to be that person. You are supposed to be a person that is held in obedience and in safety while there's revolt going on. There's people with pitchforks and torches, torching everything, burning everything, and stabbing people with those pitchforks. That's not you. Very important. You are not in rebellion. And so this is important because what it is, is Israel was not supposed to be as a nation in revolt. Now we know throughout the history of Israel, 
that they went many time into massive revolt. And the only thing that would happen is that Lord would raise up a prophet or a few people who would be faith faithful. But the rest of the country was in revolt. And this is why, that, why Israel twice, um, once in the end they closed their probation as God's special people. And in the beginning they uh, basically had to be destroyed by Babylon and taken captive. Because they were, they became like the Babylonians. They were in revolt. We are not in revolt. We are not in rebellion against God. We are not in an uprising against God's commandments. We are commandment keepers. While the rest of the world is in revolt against any law, any commandment, any righteousness. Very important. And this is what our experience is supposed to be. So the church of God is God's. Is a church is, of God is a fortress, your fortress, his city of refuge. People can be safe around you. People who are condemned or accused of crimes, accused of sin, you're supposed to be a safe haven. People are supposed to feel like they can come among you and you're safe while everybody else they feel unsafe around because. They're in revolt and they're also in revolt. Revolters revolting against revolters. And God's supposed to hold you in this world while you're in this world. And you're not supposed to be uh, scary. <laughs> you're not supposed to be a little monster. And this is how you hold yourself and your family. Your house is not supposed to be a war zone. You around you is not supposed to be a war zone. You're not having a revolt going on. And as I say, when you think about a war, you destroy the enemy at all costs. That's what revolt is. You're trying to overthrow leadership. That's what revolt is. That is not you. That should not be you. By God's grace, that's not you. We pray to God that's not your experience. We should not have in your house, in your family, as a guy, you're leading your family. You should not have your family where is an open rebellion going on. And you should, if even if that's going on, it's not you that are that is causing that rebellion, because you're not in revolt. You should not have, um, you know, your 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 children, or your wife by God's grace, or yourself, or snipers, trying to shoot each other from a far distance. You should not have people setting booby traps for each other. Uh, you should not have any type of, you think about any tactics that you would have in a war or a revolt. That should not be going on. You know, there's people who set traps for people <laughs> in homes, in their families. It, they're after each other. They're trying to take each other out. They're trying to compete to see who's going to win because they're fighting for the mastery to see who is going to lead this house. This is not supposed to be your experience. In the church that is a Christian church, that's not supposed to be the experience. We're not at war. The world is at war. So that's why James says, he says that why, where comes fighting amongst you? Where's all this madness coming from amongst you? He says, because you're unconverted. You have not found Jesus. Because if you found Jesus, you would not be like this. Because you're not supposed to be in revolt. And there's many homes that are not a blissful place because the occupants in the home who claim Jesus, they're in revolt and they're not held by God in a revolting world. They're part of the revolting world. More on that later. So in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1 through 8. Isaiah 1, verse 1 through 8. Now, here in Isaiah chapter 1, because, you know, people say, well, isn't the whole church the remnant? Well, we would not be that silly to say the whole church is the remnant. Uh, we refer to the church as the remnant church. But you notice Israel as a church, as a nation, was supposed to be unique amongst the Gentiles, amongst the pagans. They were supposed to be uniquely different. We're going to talk about that in a, in a second. But we always know throughout the biblical history that there is Israel. You could refer to them as the remnant. But... In Israel, there was always the faithful few who bear a testimony of God's work. As all Joshua said, as for me and my house, my house, 
will serve the Lord. That's what Joshua said. Now somebody could say, well, didn't Joshua speak for the whole Israel? No, Joshua is saying, I'm a bear. I'm one of the faithful in Israel. I'm going to bear testimony that as for me and my house. Now you need to make up your mind as for you and your house, what you're going to do. Because there's many a men that can stand and say that. But Joshua says, I'm going to say that. Noah says, I'm going to say that. Moses, I'm going to say that. You see, there, God always have a weakness. Sometimes the weakness is just a, one man standing there saying that. Sometimes this is a whole group of people. Sometimes it's just 120 in the upper room who says, as for me and my house, or as for me personally, I'm going to serve the Lord. So that's why I say, what Israel was supposed to be, you are supposed to be. Your house should be a city of refuge. It should be a safe place. That's the reality. Your house should be a fortress. You should be able to look out your window and see people running back and forth with pitchforks and torches setting this community ablaze. But your house is not part of that. You're not part of the corrosion of the society. You're not part of the destruction of the society. Because God holds you as a holy person, a holy family. So Isaiah chapter 1 now. Here is the introduction of Isaiah. And he's speaking now and he's laying out for you what's going on in Israel, God's church. And you're going to notice here that he says, here's the, what's going on. And you can see that the church had failed often in what it was supposed to do. But remember, even as you think about the church failing, you have to remember that Isaiah himself was faithful. Because somebody's going to be faithful. And I'm saying to you this morning here, that should be you. That should be me. Somebody's going to say, I'm not in revolt. I'm a commandment keeper. Notice in verse 2, Isaiah chapter 1. It says, hear, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord hath spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. So this is where I say, like, even this conversation I'm having, I'm speaking to people who have crossed over the Red Sea. They've been baptized. They've been blessed by the Lord. Their life has had some changes. Because here he says that I've nourished children. I've brought up children. So we're not talking about toddlers here. You know, there's people who are toddlers in the church. You know, the toddlers do what toddlers do. They, they poo their, their diapers. It's okay. They're toddlers. But when you have a 19-year-old um, doing that, you, you, there's some probably disability. So we're not talking to them. We're talking to people who, they've been around a little bit. And this was have some sense. I have nourished and brought up children. And they have rebelled against me. Many parents understand what Isaiah is saying here. The boy was not brought up to be like that. The girl was not brought up to be like that. And they rebelled against what they were brought up. That's not our experience. That's not supposed to be our experience. We're supposed to be mature in Jesus. And understand that we are called to keep the commandments of the Lord. We are called to be true spiritual Israel. We are called to be righteous and holy. We are called to be successful our home, our minds are not the battleground for the devil. We're not supposed to speak as if the devil have control over us and live as if we don't never read the Bible. We need to get up on a good foot, as they say, and get going. Now, here he says, and they have rebelled against me. Uh, notice here in verse 3 says, The ox know it is owner, and the ass is master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. So here, other places in the Bible, he says that, I think in Jeremiah, says that uh, they have been drinking from broken cisterns. They don't know. They don't consider. You know, just imagine that you could be in a church and if you tell people to keep the commandments of God, it seems like you're, you're, you're committing the unpardonable sin. They, they become silly in their thinking. You are already baptized. Uh, to tell you to live righteous and holy is not supposed to be a strange thing. 
This is what you're supposed to do. This is what you ought to already know. Because as he says here, he says, <laughs> you, you, you already supposed to know. You're not supposed to be in ignorance. And again, you're, you are to be Israel. If your home and your mind and your lifestyle is not in obedience and in accordance to the word of God, and you're not keeping all the commandments, you probably have a wrong experience and you need to probably hit the reset button and start over again. Start Bible studying again. Go get a rebaptism and start afresh. You're doing it wrong. Because it's not supposed to be. As a matter of fact, in your home, an occupant in your home, your wife, your kids, are not supposed to be in rebellion. There's something wrong with that home. You need to, again, probably start back with marriage counseling and start back with how to raise kids and how to manage your home. It's not supposed to be in rebellion. Because then, are you are you the head of the household? Are you leading your family? What's going on in your house? What What is your example that somehow your family think it's okay to be rebels? Is there something in your personal experience that causing rebellion to be a normal thing? Because if you're not a rebellion, people shouldn't feel like rebellion should be normal and acceptable. Because if your leadership is a leadership of love and true integrity and fairness and justice as Noah did, then, and, and, and I would say Abraham did, I should say, sorry, then there should be no rebellion. No rebellion. Notice here, verse 4, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord and have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward because they're rebelling. It, it, this, is, this is a total breakdown of how things are supposed to be. Total breakdown. Something's wrong. And this is why we know the story of Isaiah that what's coming next is open war. Because when things are like this, you know, you look, if you're a Christian and you have a child and your child is talking back to you, your, your child must have opinion and they must be able to express their opinion. But when they start talking back, back under their breath and start talking like revolt, you've done something wrong. You failed. Just, just, you know, you might say, oh, who are you to talk? I'm, I'm Lloyd Grubb. I'll talk. You failed. You need to go fast and pray and you go figure out and go start talk to people who have their kids under control and you figure out how to be a father. You, are you, you're doing something. Probably you're talking back to them and they're just doing what you do to them. You're probably just giving some terrible experience. Because here you can see that Israel, you see, this was the setup for war. Because Israel revolted and revolt was going to become their lunch and dinner and everything. It was going to be a destruction. And you can see families falling apart. And I can tell you, somebody said, well, is it financial problem? No, they're falling apart because there's no leadership. There is no order. There is no obedience. It's just revolt. That tell you there's no spirit of God because where the spirit of God is, there is order and decency. There is process. So notice corruptors, that means they're corrupting each other. They're leading each other to hell. Verse 5 says, Why should ye be stricken anymore? Ye will revolt again. Notice that word. Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. That means whatever revolt that's going on, whew, man, it's just getting worse. It says you can't even beat them anymore. You can't even make the situation worse. And this is where you see a, a family, a person is in a mess and they can't pull up. They can't pull back because they're trying to justify their situation. They're trying to excuse their situation and there is no excuse for it. The only thing is needed is a revival and reformation. They need to hit that reset button because something has gone wrong. Because remember, what Israel was supposed to be, that means they didn't fulfill what they were supposed to be. You're supposed to be. You can't do it the way Israel did it and get the same and get a different result. You will get the same result. What you have to do is do what Israel was supposed to do. At this speech, Israel was supposed to say, yeah, you're right. 
we messed up. Um, and because we messed up, guess what happened? We need to hit the reset button. We need to start doing things in a more spiritual way. We need to start taking responsibility for our part in play in the revolt, in the rebellion. I'll read verse 5 again. Why should you be stricken anymore? You don't need to be stricken anymore. You've got enough. Look, if you're having problems in life, you have enough problems. You don't need no more beatdowns. It's just, 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 just the truth. If you're sick right now, you know, it's enough. You know, this is it's time for you to change your diet. They, they, you don't need to suffer any more pain. You've suffered enough pain. It's time for you to start changing your lifestyle. It's time for you to get up. It's summertime. Get up and start sweating. It's time for you to start exercising and see the outdoors. It, it's just too much. I've seen some people, there's just too, too much pain. And I'm like, man, it's just you, you got to hit that reset button. The pain is telling you that you're doing something wrong. Why suffer anymore? Basically, the Bible is saying you don't need to anymore. Why? You revolt more and more. And the whole head is sick. And the whole heart faint. You see that? Somebody tell me they have an anxiety problem. Marital problem. This problem. That problem. I'm like, it's too much. I'm telling you the solution. You need to go to Jesus. You need to have a revival in your soul. This is about what if not everybody in the church having a revival. Well, you alone have that revival. Because you need it. Because your whole head is a, is a mess. Verse 6 says, The soul from the soul of the foot even unto the head. There is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that that have not been closed, neither bounded up, neither mollified with ointment. Um, you have had this experience, you know. Um, <laughs> actually, we went camping a few, two weeks ago as a church, and uh, you know, I came back with a whole bunch of banged up. You know, I, I'm even looking at my hand right now. I have a wound that is 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 closed and it's healing up. Uh, and why is that? Because you lift. I keep lifting stuff. So as I lift stuff, every now and then, uh, if it's too heavy for me, <laughs> it will drive me somewhere and bang me into something. And so, my, and and then I even had like the the um, the toe itch on the back of my vehicle. And then I'll figure that it's there. I walk right into it and then hit my shin. And then my shin swollen. And so I have bangs all over. So I come back now and like a little bit over a week later, like a litter a week later, most of the bangs, I'm not feeling pain anymore. And they're closed up and so forth. And it's not that bad as, as I'm saying. You might think, wow, so I'm, what kind of camping you guys doing? Well, it's good camping, but I'm just, I'm just got a few bangs. So I'm, I'm just thinking about what he's saying, that you're stricken, not stricken, verse 6, that you have problems when you head to your foot. You have wounds and bruises because I'm I'm sure you have had an experience where you probably hit yourself somewhere, you forget that you did it. The next day you feel pain. You're like, where does pain come from? Now just imagine you have a wound today, and it you have a gash and it opens up. Like literally, I have another gash. I was messing with a coconut, a hard, you know, one of the dry coconuts, and I gash my my hand trying to pop the coconut out of the the shell. So um, I don't do this normally, but I'm just saying this has been my experience for the week. I've been bagging myself. <laughs> so now think about that, right? You have a cut here, cut there, cut here, cut there, but none of the cuts are closing. No ointments. So somebody say, well, so what was you getting at? Here's a problem sometimes. There could be problems in your life and you're not addressing them and they're not being fixed. And because you're not addressing them and they're being fixed, next week a new problem comes along. You get what I'm saying? And the old problem last week never got fixed. And then this week there's a new problem. And then the following week there's going to be a new problem. But none of the problems got taken care of. So after a while the problems start to pile up. And then the person now has no soundness in them. There's no healing because nothing is being addressed. And sometimes in their life, that's what happened. And that's why I say it's often I've, I've dealt with people who they're being overloaded with problems. And I realize it's not the overload with a problem. It's just too many problems that are not being addressed. And it can be that way in the social, spiritual life. And it can be that way in the moral life. Sorry, in the evil health. 
Here he's describing health, but he's really describing the state of the nation. You are not supposed to be that person. You're supposed to be the person that know that there's a bomb in Gilead for the sin sick soul. There's a solution in the Bible for your problems. You need to be addressing the problems in your life because you already been baptized. You already walking with Jesus. And if there's an ointment, there's a herb, there's a remedy for your problem, you need to be applying that remedy. And you need to close some of these wounds. You need to take down some of this inflammation that you had. You know, I scratched my hand. Um, tried to, I've been scratching, just been a lot of stuff. I banged myself up a lot last week because I've been do, I was helping somebody move also last week. And, and I was just doing so many things where I have to lift stuff. So I keep banging myself. Anyhow, so, uh, you know, I get some aloe vera and I start rubbing the aloe vera in the ear that I banged my hand. And it, it, it took it down. It's not sweet. Now imagine if a month later, a week later, three weeks later, I still have that swelling. And then I go buy myself somewhere. I go, say, for a bicycle ride and I go hit myself with a bicycle or something. And then I do this, and I, but none of the wounds are healing. Next, you know, my whole body is filled with inflammation. I'm uh, so getting confused. My immune system starts start to go bad. And this is the explanation or the way many people's lives are. They have health problems, they have financial problems, they have marital problems, they have um, confusion problem, a problem in the extended family, and they just have problems of the problems. And you say, so what are you doing with any of these problems? Nothing. Have you applied anything to these problems? No. Have you sought help for these problems? No. How is your spiritual life a mess? And I'm like, that's why your spiritual life is a mess. You're not fixing anything. You're not applying no solutions. You're not seeking no solutions. And that's what messed up Israel. And that's why what Israel was supposed to be, they never became it. Because Isaiah tell you why. And you are supposed to be what Israel was supposed to be. And I'm going to tell you how you get there. You start applying some of those bombs. Start keeping some of those words that God tell you to keep. And you're going to have soundness. You're going to have healing. You're going to have inflammation. That's just the reality. Because in this life, stuff breaks. Stuff fall apart. Stuff rotten. Stuff get wasted. So if you're not keep working to maintain and fix and heal, it's going to pile up and you're going to have a lot of mess in your life. Start fixing stuff. Notice in verse 7 it says, Your country is desolate. Your cities are burnt with fire. Your land is Strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. As overthrown by the strangers. But who's doing this? You. You see, if your family life is a mess, that's you. Ain't nobody messing that up. It's you messing that up. And it's messed up, and you think somebody messed you up, and then all you realize is you. You the problem. You need to get up and get going and start to accept some of these promises that God has promised. And start to apply some balm and wound in your family. If there's revolt, you're to be blamed. You're responsible. You need to get up and get going. And don't let the desolation, because the desolation will be seen. You see, anybody can talk and say things that are not real. But the mess is obvious because it can be seen by all. Notice here, your country is desolate. If your home life, if your personal life is a mess, then it's obvious. If you're, if, if you're not overcoming your health problems, if your hygiene game is not up to par to the biblical standard, that's on you. If your exercise game is not up to par, that's on you. If your cleanliness game is not according to the Bible, that's on you. If your mouth is a mess and when you talk, people get depressed and you get depressed, that's on you. God give you a mouth to your brain. You need to use it the way God tell you to use it. That's on you. If your financial life is a mess, that's on you. God tell you what you're supposed to do, then go ahead and do it. But if you don't do it, you can't blame God or nobody else. That's on you. If your family life 
is a curse and they're just messing your home and they're just toil and turmoil and that's on you. You need to get up and get going. You need to start saying, where's that bomb? Where's that ointment? Where's that personal counseling? Where's that prayer? Where's that song? Where's that marriage counseling? I need that because I need to straighten up my life. But if you don't apply the bombs that are given to you, well, whose fault is that? Do you, do you study your Bible? Do you pray? Do you go to church? Do you fellowship? Do you go to Sabbath school? Do you go to sermon? That's on you. Do you work so hard all week that you go to church and fall asleep? That's on you. That's you messing up. Are you a man in your house? Are you a chimp? Are you a wimp? That's on you. When, you, when your wife speak, do you run through the door, run away because you're a wimp? That's on you. That's not on God. And you got to get up and get going. So notice verse 8, it says, And the daughters of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucum cucumbers, <laughs> as a besieged city. Notice it's in desolation, desolation. The desolation is evidence that you've messed up. It's not God. Because remember, I'm going to read that little statement again from Acts of the Apostle, page 11. The church is God's fortress, his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. Mess going on in the world, but not messing you. And you're not your life, because you're not in a mess. You're not in revolt. You're not in rebellion. So if your home life, your behavior is as if you're in revolt, then you're in revolt. That's not on God. If I come around you and you act as if you're in revolt, you're in revolt. That's the reality. And God doesn't hold you in a revolted world. You're part of the revolted world. If you speak as if you're in revolt, you're in revolt. You're rebelling. That's the reality. And that's not supposed to be a reality. Because that was Israel reality. Israel became a revolted city, a revolted church. There was no safety. And the righteous was not safe. If you come around me and you're righteous and you're not safe around me, I'm in rebellion. I don't matter. And you need to look at me and make sure you know, no matter what I say, what I profess, the reality is that says in the Bible says, people shall see. If I'm in revolt or not. If you come around me. And you're not safe. Then something is wrong. If you come around me. And I'm a pedophile. I'm a rapist. I'm a con man. I'm a thief. I'm a liar. I bear false witness against my neighbor. I'm covetous. I'm an adulterer. A fornicator. Whatever, I'm a false worshiper of idol gods. Whatever it is. If you come around me and that's your experience, you realize you're not safe, then I'm not held as a city of refuge. I'm in revolt. And the reality is that when somebody come around you and your home, they need to know. And they need to be able to see for themselves. Not what you say, that you say that you're a Christian. They need to see that you are not in revolt you are not in rebellion and they are safe around you. And that's the reality because God holds you in a revolted world. You are not the revolted world. No matter what the preacher might say, no matter what excuse that your mad crazy mind might want to give, you are not in revolt. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 through 9. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 through 9 says here, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Notice here, we claim this promise. You're free. And if you're free, and I'm supposed to come around you and say, Yeah, this person is free from the law of sin and death. I shouldn't come around you and feel scared. Uh, verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for sin condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace. So when I come around you, if you come around me, you are supposed to experience life and you're supposed to experience peace. You're supposed to come around me and feel like, hmm, uh, you know, thanks for being around you, Brother Lloyd or Pastor Lloyd, or whatever you want to say, I don't feel like killing myself anymore. <laughs> or I feel like I want to live for tomorrow. I feel great. Life is good around you. Because your mindset and the way you live, ah, evidence of life, and also peace. I should feel peace. Not revolt, but peace. Israel was supposed to be peaceful. Now think about this real quickly uh, here. When you come around Israel, you're supposed to be able to Let's imagine now you're traveling and you know there was this Silk Road thing. And imagine you're traveling and when you're traveling, everywhere you travel, you're scared because there's crooks and criminals and it's unsafe. It's just, it's safe, you know, no safety anywhere. You sleep with one eye open, you always have a dagger and, a, 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 you know, a sword. Then you reach into Israel and you say, Ah, oh, praise the Lord. And you travel through Israel, you should feel, oh man, you know, you know, there's evil doers everywhere. There's always weirdos. But you travel through Israel, and you're supposed to feel like, okay, uh, it's not so bad. And the moment you leave Israel, now you start getting back into, like you're going back to Egypt now. You're going into Africa. You're supposed to be like, oh man, here we go again. That's supposed to be your ex the experience that people have around you that they should see the heathen should see and say you know this is one of the safe ones because he served jesus it's not carnal minded you don't have to worry about it be this person is covetous i'm going to want to rob you for what you have because this person not in revolt this person a commandment keeper this person don't break the commandments they keep the commandments of god this person don't talk about being filled with the spirit this person is filled with the spirit a sweet spirit read it again for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7 says, because the carnal mind is, is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So if you ever hear a preacher preaching, no matter what denomination they belong to, and they're saying you can't keep the commandment of God, remember that person's carnal. They're speaking their belief because they're speaking their experience. They're not going to keep the law. You're not safe amongst them. If you're a Christian and you're not carnally minded, you can be subject to the law of God because you're not in revolt. You're in obedience because the Spirit of God is upon you. The Lord has written His law in your heart as you love to do the will of God because the law is written in your heart. Praise the Lord. Verse 8 says, So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh. But in the spirit is so that the spirit of God dwell in you. So if you're um, in the flesh. Oh, and I'll read that last part. No, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. We don't belong to Christ unless we have a spirit of Christ. No matter what is written in any church book and in a church record. We are in revolt. We're not supposed to be in revolt because we serve the living God. Now, a few points here, but before I go to a few points, remember I promise you I'm going to read a whole quotation from Acts of the Apostle, page 11, paragraph 2 and 3. I want to read this to you again. And notice here the church. Remember, what the church is supposed to be, cannot, it cannot happen unless you are in obedience to the will of God. Acts of the Apostle, chapter, page 11. It says, the church of God, the church is God's fortress, his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. And a betrayal of the church is treachery to him who has brought, who has bought mankind with the blood of his only begotten son. From the beginning, faithful souls have constituted the church on earth. In every age, the Lord has had his watchmen who have borne a faithful testimony to the generation in which they lived. 
they, these sentinels gave the message of warning. And when they were called to lay off their armor, others took up the work. God brought these weaknesses into co covenant relation with himself, uniting the church on earth with the church in heaven. He has sent forth his angels to minister to his church, and the gates of hell have not been able to prevail against his people. Through centuries of persecution, conflict, darkness, God has sustained his church. Not one cloud has fallen upon it that he has not prepared for. for. Not one opposing force has risen to counter work his work that he has not foreseen. All has taken place as he predicted. He has not left his church forsaken, but has traced in prophetic declarations that what would occur, and that which his spirit inspired the prophets to foretell has been brought about. All his purposes will be fulfilled. His law is linked with his throne, and no power of evil can destroy it. Truth is inspired and guarded by God, and it will triumph over all opposition. So when we think about truth, the commandment in the church, when we think about what God has laid out in the Bible, God will always have faithful people. God will always have sentinels who will give a warning. You and I simply have to decide what side we are on. And the moment you decide that, then you realize your task, your position is not a position where you're wishy-washy and you're flipping back and forth you on god's side you on god's side and everything that is around you and that is with you that is led by you that's under your guidance and command is not in rebellion against god you're not in rebellion against god you are held in a revolted world in a world where there's the command of God is ignored, it is rebelled against, it is disrespected, but you are not that person. You have the 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 blessings that Israel was promised being fulfilled in your life. You are a person that believes in the Creator God. You keep the Sabbath day holy. You hold the commandment as dear and something that you love because you love God. You are a person who believes in righteousness by faith. You believe in health. That was what Israel was promised. Now, Israel rebelled against it. Ironically enough, I always say, interesting how God works because uh, there's not there was not much talk about health until what we call these last days. Similar to the time of the Exodus, when God led the children into the wilderness, he introduced them to the health message. He wanted to give them a health message before he brought them in to the promised land. So we have a health message. Because God wanted the people who are on a clean diet to clean up their brain and don't let them act like animals. If you want to act like angels, you eat like the angels. You eat angels' food. You want to act like an animal and be carnal, you eat carnal food and soulish food, all this nasty meat and stuff like that. So God called us and God said, get off that diet. And I said, praise the Lord. And you start seeing your karma. You start acting more sensible because you're not eating pigs, so you don't act like a pig. And that's the reality. In in all aspects of our life, we're supposed to be clean, holy, just. We're supposed to be fair in all that we do. This is what we are called to do. And this is supposed to be with me, as it says, as for me and my house. It begins with me, O oh Lord. I'm in need of prayer. And it starts with me first. So what Israel was supposed to be, you are supposed to be that. And when you do that, and I do that, the Bible says we're two or three are gathered together. That's the church. And that's the holy church that God holds in a, revolt, in a revolted world. This is what we're supposed to be. I pray that you may be faithful to this and faithful to this, especially as you lead out in your family. Let's pray. Our Father, Lord, in heaven, we thank thee again for the blessings of your word. We thank you that the word, dear Lord, has a place in our heart. May you bless us, dear Father, that we might respond to thy spirit as he writes, he writes the commandments in our minds. Bless us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Thanks for being with me here on Revive Reform Radio. Looking forward to talking to you again live tomorrow morning where we should talk about the importance of church. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.